Let's check in with late June of 1983. Sarah Jessica Parker and Michael J. Fox are on in prime time. On the radio, there are big names and one-hit wonders. And in the movies, it's a long list of blockbusters. You aren't going to believe what was in the theaters this week. Hit that subscribe button and get ready for another reminder of why the 80s was the greatest decade ever. You're watching This Week in the 80s, and it starts right now. So at this time, I was just starting to listen to music for what it actually was, instead of it just being noise in the background and stuff to sing along to that my parents were playing. My older brother, he's a couple of years older than me, sort of had control of the radio at all times. So I was basically going to listen to whatever he wanted to listen to. Fortunately for me, he had great taste in music. It's number 40, brand new on the charts, Cuts Like a Knife by Brian Adams. 39, Solitaire, Laura Branigan. Number 38, Billy Idol's White Wedding. This has only been on the charts for six weeks at this point in time. You don't even know all the words yet. Can you remember a time when you didn't know all the words to White Wedding? It's probably around June of 1983. Falling out of the charts, it had already been on for 16 weeks. Brian Adams again with Straight to the Heart. So Brian Adams, 40 and 37. 36, 15 weeks on the chart, falling down a little bit from 26 to 36. Little Red Corvette by Prince. Don't Pay the Ferryman, Chris DeBerg. Number 34 is probably my favorite 80s one-hit wonder. I don't know why. It's not really all that great of a song. It's just super fun, and I've loved it since the day I heard it. It's Thomas Dolby with, what is it? Do you know Thomas Dolby? Do you know? You're right. It's She Blinded Me With Science. Science! Every time that comes up, every time anyone even says science, I just instinctively say, science! It really embarrasses the people I'm with, but people who I'm not with, who are big 80s fans, think it's really funny. Science! Try it sometime. Number 33, brand new on the charts. Get this one. Prince with 1999. Remember when it's 1983. 1999 was forever away. Like it was going to be forever until 1999. Now it seems like it was just yesterday. It wasn't. It was 22 years ago. Oh, 32 is the Eurythmics with Sweet Dreams Are Made of This. Sweet Dreams Are Made of the. Yeah, you know what? That's just. Uh, the Eurythmics weren't for me. It's just not my style. 31, Bob Seger, Roll Me Away. 30, Donna Summer, She Works Hard for the Money. 30 to 20 is not so impressive. Uh, 29, Flock of Seagulls, Wishing. 28, Jim Capaldi with That's Love. I don't know. Stevie Nicks with Stand Back. Rod Stewart with Baby Jane. Rod Stewart appears so often on 80s playlists and, and 80s top 100 lists. And like his music is terrible. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. It's not, I mean, it's not terrible. Obviously a lot of people love it. He's been packing the house for 40 years, but I was never, wait a second. I did go see Rod Stewart. That girl, that girlfriend of mine, that ex-girlfriend, she still owes me for that one. Number 25, is there something I should know? Duran Duran, please, please tell me now. Duran Duran rocks, man. They're awesome. Number 24, you know who doesn't rock? You know who's not awesome? The Bee Gees, the woman in you. Good night. Number 22, the Little River Band with We Too. Now, I just did a, a week from 1984, and I think the Little River Band was on that one too. Like, what? Why were they always on the list? It's not like we were all country kids. Like, we just wanted rock and roll and one hit wonders. The Barge is on this list twice. Like, 20 to 10, better save us. Number 20, Lionel Richie with My Love. Number 19, Our House by Madness. Number 18, Overkill by Men at Work. You know, when you think of Men at Work, you think of. Land Down Under, you think of Who Can It Be Now? And then you kind of trail off. They had a few other great songs, not that many. You know, Johnny B. Good was a pretty good one, and uh, Overkill is another one. Number 16, Elton John, I'm Still Standing. 15, Michael Jackson, Want to Be Starting Something. Number 14, how's this for a hardcore, real deal, super solid 80s, one-hit wonder, The Tubes with She's a Beauty. Now, you know, I always picture where I was and who I was at the time when I started hearing these songs. And She's a Beauty by the Tubes was on the radio when I was 10. So there I am, 10 years old, hanging out with my brother, who's 12 or 13 at the time. Maybe we're in the car with my mother and my father. And you know, if we were my father, we were listening to the Beatles. Maybe we're in the car with my mother. And, you know, She's a Beauty comes on by the Tubes. And there I am singing along about some dude at the strip club, you know, don't fall in love. You know, if you do, you find out she don't love you. Like, that's not a song that 10-year-olds should be singing. But we were. Gotta love the 80s. Number 13, another one of my favorite 80s one-hit wonders. 
always something there to remind me by Naked Eye. 12, one for the ladies. Faithfully by Journey. 11 was Michael Jackson and Beat It. Number 10, Kaja Gugu with Shy to Shy. Such an 80s song. Shy to Shy, Hush Hush, I Know Why, something like that. It's, that's one of those ones where you mumble it along and turn it up a bit so nobody knows you don't know what the hell you're saying. They don't know either. Number nine, Affair of the Heart by Rick Springfield. When I started doing these shows, I thought that Rick Springfield had two hits, Jesse's Girl and Don't Talk to Strangers. Turns out he had a lot more. Not, not really all that groundbreaking stuff, but at least he's not a two-hit wonder. Number eight, Never Gonna Let You Go by Sergio Mendez. Number seven, Don't Let It End by Styx. Number six, Family Man by Hall & Oates. Number five, one of my favorite David Bowie songs, Let's Dance. Number four. Now, this song at number four has been on the charts for four weeks and it rocketed right up because people just loved it. The truth is, this song's creepy as hell. It's, when you first hear it, you think it's a love song, but then you actually start listening to it. Every breath you take by the police is just flat out about stalking the hell out of somebody. But we sung it out and we sung it loud and we loved it. Number three, Eddie Grant with Electric Avenue. You know we're going to rock down to it, and then we're going to take it higher. Number two, Time by the Culture Club. And number one, this week, Flashdance. What a feeling by Irene Cara. So not a bad list this week. We had some big names. We didn't have much for like the real rock songs that are going to come around in the later 80s. But we did have some fantastic one-hit wonders and a couple of songs that are going to be with us forever. It's late June in 1983. You want to go to the movies tonight. So you're checking the paper. You were going to call, but your mother's using the phone. So you're looking through and you're trying to decide which one you're going to see. There are like 17 viable options. A list of movies this strong doesn't come around very often. What a difficult decision you would have had. You could have just gone to the movies every day and seen two or three of them. And it would have taken you almost a week to see all the great movies that were out. This is going to take a little while. So get yourself a snack and let's get started. At number 18 this week, at the very bottom was my tutor. Remember my tutor, the two guys are trying to, trying to get it on with their teacher. That wouldn't fly today, but it was pretty good in 1983. Number 17 was Valley Girl. Nicolas Cage and all that ridiculous lingo that they used. I am proud to say I have not seen this movie. I'm even proud to say I don't want to. Number 16, Still Smoking with Cheech and Chong. That one did pretty well. And eight weeks in, it had already made $15 million. $15 million with Tommy Chong just saying, man... 500 times every 30 seconds. Good movie, though. Number 15 this week, Breathless. This was Richard Gere doing film noir, some remake of some French movie from 1960. Skip that. Go to number 14 instead. Number 14 was The Man with Two Brains with Steve Martin. A little comic relief for you. I think Steve Martin's one of the funnier comedians from the 80s. Number 13 was Tootsie. Dustin Hoffman dressed up like a woman. Number 12, The Guy from Jaws. In a helicopter. Blue Thunder. Blue Thunder grossed $37 million. Roy Scheider and his helicopter, $37 million. Awesome. Number 11 this week was Yellowbeard. It's his first week on the charts, and it had a long list of really funny guys, and you put them all together, and it's this big ensemble, and it's supposed to be as funny as can ever be, and it bombed. It was terrible. The cast is tremendous. Graham Chapman. Madeline Kahn, Cheech and Chong, Peter Boyle, Eric Idle, John Cleese, Peter Cook. Pretty impressive list. Problem was, it wasn't a pretty impressive script. This movie bombed. According to the actors, they would have done it again if they had the chance because they had so much fun acting it. The problem was, the movie itself stunk. Yellowbeard only grossed $1.5 million. Boo to you, Yellowbeard. But... You should watch it if you, if you love crappy movies, because that's certainly one. All right, let's check out the top 10. Number 10, Psycho 2, because Psycho 1 wasn't enough for you. They did another one. Number nine, we just went over the fact that number one on the music list was Flashdance. Number nine on the movie list is also Flashdance. It's been in the movies for 11 weeks so far, $51 million. Flashdance got everybody rocked up. Number eight, The Survivors. Number seven, War Games, Matthew Broderick. Would you like to play a game? Remember how scary they used to make the computers, right? They're still scary just for way other reasons. Number six, James Bond, Octopussy. Imagine if they came out with that today. Parents would flip. 
You can't call the movie Octopussy. You can't have that sort of word on the marquee. How will my son ever exist? How will my daughter live? Number five, Trading Places with Aykroyd and Murphy. Good stuff. The fourth highest grossing film this week was Twilight Zone the movie. It debuted at number four, raking in $6.6 million. It's a fine movie. If you like the Twilight Zone, you like all their stories, it'll be enjoyable. But you go back and watch it and you're like, yeah, you know what? The animation doesn't hold up and the stories don't much hold up either. One of the troubling parts about that movie was the fact that Vic Morrow and two children were killed while filming this movie. They were doing a night scene that had a helicopter and because of something to do with the heat and I don't know, I'm no scientist, but I can tell you this, the helicopter fell out of the sky and those people were below it. Vic Morrow got decapitated. Number three on the list was Porky's 2 the next day. They never should have made this movie. I mean, listen, it made money, right? I mean, it made $7 million the first week out. I watched this literally this morning and not only did I not laugh, but I just more often just rolled my eyes and did something else while it was on. It's not worth seeing. The storyline is weak. All the shock value that they tried to build in was surprisingly unsurprising. And I really could have gone another day without having to see Old Man Wiener. Because there's like six or seven times when it's just flat out right in front of you. Here's an old man's wiener. I hope you're enjoying the movie. I wasn't. Checking into the number two slot with $9 million for the week is Superman 3. It's got Christopher Reeve, so I'm going to go see it. It's also got Richard Pryor in it. Richard Pryor does not belong in a Superman movie. Anytime they take someone that I know, let's say, for example, Samuel L. Jackson, and they put him into a role that I don't know. Let's say Star Wars, he played Mace Windu, right? I have no idea anything about who Mace Windu may be because I just see Sam Jackson on the screen. In other movies, they interject someone like Woody Harrelson and Woody Harrelson's playing a secondary role and he's supposed to be this person or that, but he's not, he's Woody Harrelson. In this role, Richard Pryor was playing Richard Pryor. You can't give me that character in a Superman movie. Like I'm not there for sight gags and giggles. Like this is a Superman movie, let's go. It ended up doing fine. I mean, it made $80 million, but it took them 40 to make it. So they weren't so pleased with it, but didn't stop from making another one. Number one on the list this week in June of 1983, Return of the Jedi. Jedi was awesome. I remember wanting to go see it and my brother went without me because that's the kind of brother that he was. I remember crying at the kitchen table. I just wanted to go see it so bad. And, you know, he had seen it and he knew the whole story and I had all the toys and like Star Wars was my thing, man. And then I finally got to go. And you know what? My dad took me and we went and saw it and we went out and bought another ticket, went back in and saw it again. And that was one of my favorite days of my life with my dad was seeing Jedi twice. And it's a good movie. A lot of people get bent out of shape and they're like, oh, the Ewoks ruined Star Wars. Well, you know what came next, don't you? The Ewoks were fantastic. Plus, one of the Ewoks was Willow. How can you go wrong with that dude? It's Monday night, June 20th, 1983. What are you watching on television? Well, if you're watching NBC, it's Love, Sydney. This was a Tony Randall show about a man with an alternative lifestyle that was way ahead of its time. They pushed the envelope, they pushed it too far, and the network execs just canceled it. On CBS, however, you had Square Pegs. Square Pegs was a good show. People loved it. People watched it. But it got canceled, and we didn't find out why until much later on. Now, the stars of this show were people like Sarah Jessica Parker. They're like 14, 15, 16 years old, playing high school kids, coming-of-age sort of comedy. And apparently behind the scenes, it was a lot of drinking, drugs, and sex. Even the guys from Devo were blown away by how bad it was. As soon as the network executives found out about that, they pulled the plug on square pegs too. Sorry, Jessica Parker turned out okay. At 8.30 on CBS, we had Private Benjamin. They built the show off the movie. The movie did really well, the show didn't. It had its share, but not enough to make it a long time show. Maybe because on NBC, everyone was watching Family Ties. Michael J. Fox and Justine Bateman, how can you go wrong with that? At nine o'clock, MASH. Now MASH was over. It was literally over. They had the last episode, Farewell and Goodbye or whatever it was, but everyone still loved MASH, so they just kept showing the reruns. At 9.30, Archie Bunker's Place. All in the Family was an iconic show. 
that had its run and its run was long. Eventually, people got tired of it. Not necessarily Carol O'Connor, who still loved being Archie Bunker, but other people involved in the show did. Norman Lear didn't want to do it anymore. Gene Stapleton, who played Edith, didn't want to do it anymore either. So they agreed that, yes, we'll let Archie continue. We'll let Archie live. Carol can still be Archie, but it can't be all in the family. So they created Archie Bunker's place. Gene Stapleton agreed to be on four or five of the shows. The show ended up being on for four years. Gene didn't have to come back. They killed her off after the first year, which is horrible to say, but that's what they did. NBC threw a movie on, and a lot of people watched this one. They got a 31 share. It was uh, She's Dressed to Kill, some movie from 1979 that I never saw. At 10 o'clock, you had to continue watching that movie or Cagney and Lacey. If it's me watching TV tonight, I'm going to watch Square Pegs, Family Ties, and then just go to bed because the rest of it isn't worth it. Plus, I'm only 10 years old. I got school in the morning. We're going to wrap it up with that here on This Week in the 80s. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to click the bell so you know when new things come out. Don't forget to check the playlist. I've got some awesome music playlists that you're going to love. Put them on, crank them up, tell your friends. Hey, you know what? If you wouldn't mind, could you share this video with one or two of your friends? Maybe put it on your Facebook page or send someone a text and say, hey, check out Paul on This Week in the 80s. This show's really fun. I'd appreciate it. I'm going to keep doing it. You keep sticking around. I'll see you next week for more This Week in the 80s.